Welcome to the journey. I'm Nathan, and this is the Modern Bushido Project. Today, we are going to get into the game model and starting off with the winning model. This make a little bit more sense and context of the four collective model with your tactical, technical, psychological, and physical. Building winning teams. At the beginning of every season, season Judd Wooden would have his athletes tie their shoes to his very specific instructions. The reason why is improperly laced shoes led to blisters, and blisters lead to lost points. Lost points lead to lost games. So the question we have to ask ourselves often is about what we think we know, and what are the second and third order effects. Translation for the tactical community is sometimes the hyper overcontrolled nature of military procedures seem inefficient, and they can be if they're misapplied. But they can also be useful in creating effective tasks that at first seem benign, but end up being very effective. High-level performers will execute based on the instincts they've developed and their abilities to anticipate what's about to happen. Uh, this is kind of one of those scenarios where you ever know that an individual was about to throw you a sucker punch. Uh, maybe you could sense an ambush when you're on patrol. These aren't a supernatural version of the sixth sense, but a science-based predictive patterning that our brains just do. Uh, it's primarily tuned with repetition and experiences. So all those experiences are going to lead to that. Space can create time, but time cannot always create space. So if you think of uh, a gunfight, you can get an edge by decreasing your opponent's effective shots by giving you additional time to engage by increasing the distance. But having extra time doesn't necessarily stop them from throwing punches at you. So difference between space and time. Better players are going to create space through techniques. So pure movement speed is not always the determining factor of successful execution. Using good tactical awareness, on the other hand, can help in choosing a more efficient path, resulting in better shooting lanes, although it may have to take more time to get there, if that makes sense. The complexity and rate of all decision-making in games are determined by ball speed, not player speed. So in the gunfighting world, how do we determine what the ball is? Uh, I, I think it might be momentum. So if you have another idea of what you would consider the ball in relation to uh, the gunfighting world, Leave a comment below and let me know what you think. So getting into that, uh, players and teams exposed to the highest game speeds and situational complexities are those that can execute the best under pressure. For high level success, athletes should be exposed to game-like speed and decision making daily in practice. So we've always heard you will fight as you train. Well, you will fight as you've trained. Uh, the more you've trained at speeds and complexities closest to fighting, the more successful your execution. So a lot of times we tend to focus on things at very slow paces uh, to make sure everybody gets a crawl, walk, run, but we rarely ever actually run. So just something we have to be aware of as we're building these winning teams. Data. Uh, scores and points and admin files don't necessarily reflect combat effectiveness. Just something to keep in mind as you're going through these things. Like, cool, this guy's got an APFT score. Uh, this unit has really good scores and metrics when they got evaluated at NTC or CTC. Just things to think about. Those are just admin scores. Uh, we want to make sure that we are training under very complex uh, ac uh, activities that have pressure. Uh, successful teams is less about having kind of those freaks. Those guys are really good at physical activities, uh, but it's more about the players that have better technical skill and tactical awareness. You see this with the old guys with decades of skill who almost always crush the young studs in pretty much any endeavor with the exception of maybe the gym. Uh, it's just like when you go to the, to the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu gym and you get rolled up by some really fat, out-of-shape dude <laughs> who's chomping on a donut, yet you're tied up in no pretzel. So kind of that same concept. All right, so moving into the actual game model itself. Uh, everybody's got a game model. A lot of times you think of that tax up that everybody's like, oh, cool, let's, let's, let's go buy the tax up. But then nobody actually pays attention to it. They write it, they talk about it, but they never actually pay attention to it. What generally is the case 
is that you've already created an informal tax op and or we can call this a game model that is in your head unwritten but it is more dynamic and functional than the written one so as we're writing tax ops maybe we should keep that in mind is, is something else to, to think about um, so the game model is what is and we could call this a tax op ish kind of thing for the tactical world is what's currently perceived as an optimal approach to winning that's most universally accept applicable. So it, it just gives you a framework to work with uh, and something that you can kind of change and evaluate and, and move on. Uh, challenge we find and develop the model that works best for your team and your uh, individuals. Perfect model doesn't really exist. TTPs will always evolve and change with conditions on the ground. Only by evaluating the principles, the moments, and the micro moments, which we will get into when we start getting into the actual four co-actives, uh, can better understand how to achieve the primary aim of all teams, which is winning. And winning in a sport is the same as winning in a gunfight. It's all basically the same thing. So something to think about is when is the last time you have filmed your team executing a drill? How do you know that specific drill will be effective against an opponent? So we must always be evaluating those principles. <clears throat> chaos of team sports science. Even though we can't hope to fully quantify or measure every single facet of the game, particularly those intangibles involving players' emotions and motivations and the complex interactions among biological and neurological processes, we could at least implement a blueprint that acknowledges each of them. Despite the limitations of any plan, we could still use a game model to assess performance in a more holistic and sophisticated way than in the past, and use this all-encompassing analysis to inform real-world practice. The better each team and its players are prepared, the more able they are to focus on the unexpected events that occur in every game, and the less overwhelmed they will be in the thick of the action. For the individual, richer preparation for either game day or combat allows more of the functional reserve to be left intact for adapting to new situations and for easier orientation during individual movements in the game. At the team level, this means better decision making and more successful outcomes, no matter the sport or no matter the career path in our case. The more realistic and in-depth your training, the more likely you can adapt to unpredicted situations in operations. Looking at the game model, we have different components. Before we get to the game model, just something else we want to talk about, uh, culture and environment. I don't think that was on the previous page. Oh, yeah, it was. Uh, the model for every team must be born from the people to whom the team and players are most exposed to on a daily basis. You'll see the style of play with different teams, such as older NHL teams. Um, think of like the old Philadelphia team was very much the style of the city. Think of some of the older Boston teams, uh, whether it's basketball or baseball or whatever sport you think of, they all had a very similar personality to the people in their, their environment that they interact with a lot. So whoever your individuals interact with the most, they're going to start to take on a little bit of that culture, a little bit of that attitude, which isn't a bad thing. Uh, it could be a good thing. You just have to be aware of that. Think of some players who didn't fit in on certain teams. Often this isn't because of their skill sets, but because of their attitudes, emotions, and psychologies. John Boyd said if the game plan is set and acted on, it's easier to generate uncertainty, confusion, disorder, panic, chaos. To shatter cohesion, produce paralysis, and bring about the collapse of your opponent. So things to think about, what is the culture, the populace around your base of operations, uh, around your stateside base, around your police department? How does that directly affect your team positively, negatively, or just neutral? The goal of the game model is to find the best way to explain the game, or in our case, the way to explain operations. The game model is used as a blueprint to better understand the game, so the team can design tactics and strategies, keeping everyone on the same page with consistent communication. Elements of communicating a sound game model, a dynamic, living, and evolving idea. A description of team identity on game day, a collection of identifiable and distinguishable principles. Always open-ended, allowing answers to be found in-house as a team. The game model 
is more of a dynamically flexible version of a tax op. Even a strength and condition coach can design games and activities in the offseason that puts players in situations where they must create space in order to be successful. So if you can't directly train your specific skills year-round, you can develop other activities that will develop decision-making and other skills, which then leads us to the game model, which consists of the game moments. Game moments have offense, defense, transition from offense to defense, transition from defense to offense, micro moments within each game moment. The game principles must be adapted for the gunfighter world. A principle isn't a lengthy treatise, but rather a clear, concise definition of an action or a series of actions with a goal. The objective for any team of, in every sport are objective one, win a possession, score. When not in possession, get possession. Then see objective one. A game model is just how to achieve these objectives. And we can think in our world instead of a uh, score, scoring could just be winning a fight, winning a battle, whatever context and level you are at. Sports in general are all about structure and formation, ball movement, player movement, and player sequencing and timing of actions. We could just transfer those right over to the gunfighting world. Structure and formation, uh, very similar. You know, we, we have structures, we have formations. Ball movement, like I said, we could bring that into momentum, I think is probably a good context for, uh, uh, I should say translation for ball movement. Player movement is obviously your individual gunfighters moving around. Player sequencing and timing of action. So ensuring that everyone is on the same page and we time, uh, have a time on target and we have the right timing and sequencing. Uh, you know, we got to breach the door before we can enter the building. Bruce Lee said, obey the principles without being bound by them. This model represents a unifying medium that provides a directed way to tie initiative of many subordinate actions with superior intent as a base to diminish friction and compress time. By establishing the aims as team aims, we set the goal as a team target. Later, we can establish the individual roles and responsibilities needed to achieve this, but they are not the starting point. So we want to start with the team first and then move to the individuals. Using commander's intent. It is a surprising truth that in team sports, commander's intent sometimes becomes obscured, and it's the same thing on the tactical side. When we fail to create a plan in which all roads lead to the big picture imperative, players and coaches and staff can start chasing aims that subvert or even sabotage such an intention and sub goals below it. You see this all the time where Twitter has one intent and everybody's got their own plan and own ideas and it just kind of goes all over the place. Over-reliance on statistics, in our case in tactical world, can be technology. In recent years, it's led many teams down the rabbit holes that they believe will lead to better game day performance, but instead merely divert attention from things that have a real impact on the scoreboard, or in our case, in the fight. With a soccer example, a false statistics-driven impression could lead to a decision that runs against the law of unintended consequences, and suddenly the team is less likely to achieve the commander's intent of winning the last three games of the year. So if you think of uh, a soccer, soccer team, they went with the statistics of mileage when it came to uh, how many miles or kilometers the team individuals had run. And they used that as their practice and their training and what they were aiming for. And it didn't actually achieve the commander's intent, which was to win the game. If you can't measure it, you can't improve it. If this were actually a true statement, current investments in analytics technology We'd have already solved every problem, prevent every injury, and created leagues of super teams. So just measuring it isn't necessarily going to ensure that we can actually improve it. Uh, giving athletes too much information stagnates their decision making and spreads their physical and mental efforts too thin. Um, this is also related to what we think of in the fight sciences uh, of having too many choices. Generally, people pick none in a high stress situation, which is not what we're looking for. The most effective in coach, coaches and commanders give three or less aims for competition or battle. First one is going to be commander's intent to win. Focus on your strengths as a team and then limit the opponent's strength or tendencies. If you can do those three things, chances of your success are much higher. Each game moment will have an objective, a micro principle. Coaches should give their players functional goals within the game plan and then empower them to use whatever form is needed from their skills, experience, and creativity to achieve that. The use of specificity has no place within the game plan objectives. That'll be for later. 
Athletes should be told as little as possible about the drills they participate in and should instead be allowed to learn through discovery. So during practice and training, we want to put the drills out there and allow the athletes to come up with their own lessons. In our case, the gunfighter up with their own lessons. For any action in a sporting contest, there's what the coach instructed, and this is the same in the tactical world. So what the, the coach or the uh, trainer instructed, what the player understood, or the tactical athlete, what the opposition allowed you to do, and what you, the observer, perceived, all of which can be very different. So if we're watching a game, the coach is going to instruct one thing, the player is going to understand something different, and the opposition is going to allow something else. And then you, as the observer watching the game, are going to have a completely different context. It's kind of like a, a recipe that's written by a chef, is then interpreted by a home cook, and then tasted by the hungry child. Uh, the intended, perceived, and actual results don't always line up. This displays how complex and difficult it is to interpret performance correctly. So to translate that, how can you apply the game model to your unit? And how will you communicate that to your unit or to your athletes? So that's kind of what we're talking about with the game model. The game model will then evolve into the four coactives, which are your tactical, technical, psychological, and physical. Uh, so this is just kind of the overarching concept looking at like how are we going to get after our specific objectives and activities that are general and then you can break it down into for this game or for this operation we're going to do it this way uh, so the game model just kind of gives us that big overarching directive so if you like this uh, please comment below if you have any comments to add uh, I'll be coming out with more videos on the four coactives. This is just the overarching philosophy of why we should have a game model first, and then we can start getting into the individual coactive components. Thank you, and I will talk to you next time.